In a historic district in Pasadena, California, bounded by a Domino's Pizza on one corner and a 7-Eleven on the other, you'll find heaven, bungalow heaven. This type of house, the bungalow, and particularly the Craftsman Bungalow, is now celebrated in historic districts from Raleigh, North Carolina to Seattle, Washington. But the Craftsman Bungalow only became a phenomenon through the evolution of a socialist artist's philosophy to a mass market factory operation. The definition of a Craftsman Bungalow is really slippery, but to explain it, let's take three 1911 examples from the American founder of the Craftsman movement, Gustav Stickley. These bungalows are all low and wide, with roofs overhanging a porch. Compare that to a Queen Anne Victorian house, common in the late 1800s. The Queen Anne has turrets and a wraparound porch and all sorts of ornamentation. It was also huge and expensive. But bungalows aren't just small. You can see the difference when you compare the shape to a New Orleans shotgun house, which is small and low, but also long and skinny. The bungalow interiors feature relatively open floor plans like this. No lawn hallways, just connected spaces. And materials are hopefully natural, highlighting simple wood and stone over artifice. An ideal craftsman interior might look like this, with built-in features like this window seat and piano, beams showing off the materials, and details like these lanterns that hang from the ceiling. A true craftsman bungalow is simple, but well-appointed, built carefully with attention to every detail. And that highlights the craftsman bungalow paradox. How did a meticulously crafted movement become a mass movement? I'll be honest, before I started this video, I kind of thought craftsman tools is where craftsmen came from. And it is true that they are kind of connected, but it started somewhere else entirely. These chairs are from the Crystal Palace Exhibition of 1851 in London. It was a massive exhibition, showing off the newest, most advanced, everything. The arts and crafts movement was born in response, a push to stop making these chairs and start making ones like these. Cleaner, simpler, poet slash artist slash textile guy slash socialist William Morris was one of many arts and crafts figures but he became key to the craftsman movement in America after his death. Today, he's best known for his gorgeous designs. Like on these playing cards I've got that were made in some factory in China, and you can get stuff with his original designs printed on it almost anywhere, uh, from playing cards to your quaint pandemic face masks. Morris reacted against industrialization and artifice that was happening during the Industrial Revolution. He was in favor of craftsmanship and beauty. He inspired Gustav Stickley, the guy who wrote that book of craftsman plans and made that chair to promote the arts and crafts movement in America with his 1900s magazine, The Craftsman. The first issue was all about William Morris, including his socialistic career, which united with his art in that a workman could pursue the creation of beauty as necessary as daily bread. Craftsmen, he claimed, found value in the quality of their work not as disengaged factory employees. Future editions of The Craftsman promoted similarly eclectic topics from poets to factory reform. And there was a lot of furniture, since that was Stickley's background. The magazine name, Craftsman, became the way to identify arts and crafts in America. Entire homes started to show up in the magazine as well, including, in 1903, The Craftsman Bungalow. How to Build a Bungalow noted that the word started near the banks of the Ganges, but had since been transformed to a new architectural form. The craftsmen had recommendations for how to build it all properly. Over time, the magazine featured more and more craftsmen house plans, including plans for bungalows. They adhered to those arts and crafts tenets. Natural materials, intentional construction, and as bungalows, a low slung shape and relatively open floor plan. Stickley tied the bungalow to the craftsman movement. And then dollar signs showed up on the plans. 
craftsman and bungalow had become these buzzwords, kind of like tiny house today, and nobody controlled the brand. So all the bungalows started getting lumped together. I love these two papers by Janet Orr and Kim Hernandez that show how bungalows got commercialized in the development of the Seattle suburbs and in a Los Angeles bungalow boom. Across the country in the 1900s, new areas needed hundreds of homes. Stickley himself started selling floor plans so Craftsman fans could build their own homes with their own builders, including Craftsman bungalows. Originally, Craftsman homes came from Stickley's plans or a few other esteemed practitioners. But anybody could sell floor plans or build houses and make a lot of money off that style. In Seattle, an entrepreneur named Judd Yoho. Judd Yoho. Do not trust Judd Yoho. Judd Yoho sold craftsman bungalows with no real affiliation to the arts and crafts movement and the creation of beauty. His goal was to turn craftsmen into a volume business. The same thing happened down in Los Angeles where practical bungalows were built by the Los Angeles Investment Company, a real estate firm that developed land, took craftsman style, and built tons of homes with the help of a massive mill and shops. Sears, then a catalog company, was the Amazon of the era, and they joined in. They sold 70,000 kit homes between 1908 and 1940, including a bunch of bungalows with craftsman flair. Salesmen from Portland to Topeka packaged bungalow style, all of which had a similar floor plan and often a craftsman-like style, but without Gustav Stickley or the philosophy of the arts and crafts movement. By 1909, the New York Times was publishing full-blown trend pieces about the call of the bungalow. It was the latest dream of spring poet and real estate man. By the 1920s, Craftsman was such a strong brand that Sears bought the trademark in 1927 and they put it on tools. What started as a movement for a socialist textile maker had become a gold rush, where different types of bungalows capitalized on the Craftsman cachet. A Craftsman bungalow can look like an artistic expression of individual mastery, or it can look like hustlers capitalizing on a trend. But really, it can look like both of those things. And that, to a lot of people, looks just like heaven. Okay, so there is a whole world of people who are obsessed with these kit homes and where they actually ended up. And a lot of those include craftsman homes. I found one blog called Oklahoma Houses by Mail. And this woman had found the Los Angeles Investment Company catalog that I show earlier in this video. And then she tracked down the location of the house that is on the cover and you can find it on Street View today. It's got a different coat of paint, but it is the same building. 